and welcome to another edition of Cancer with the Dr. Denise Edjo, CEO of Cobwood Cancer Foundation in partnership with PLUS TV Africa. Um, Happy New Year once again and thank you for joining us. This is um, very interesting. I actually think I really appreciate your time, your, your viewing, because with you we can do a lot of things. So let us look at it. This month is Cervical Cancer Awareness Month. A lot is happening across Nigeria. So my notice, I encourage both men and women alike to please inquire and learn about this disease as knowledge is power. So in the house today, we've got a specialist who's going to be talking to us, my big sister, as I would always look up to her for anything. Mm -hmm. Our guest is Professor Ifoma Okoye, Professor of Radiology, College of Medicine, University of Nigeria Teaching Hospital. She's also a director at the University Center for Clinical Trials, UNNCECT, and co-founder of the African Clinical Trials Consortium. Prof is also a principal investigator on several research papers in Nigeria, Africa, and globally. She is fondly referred referred to as Pinky Prof in the cancer space in Nigeria and across the world. So don't 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 be looking at her sitting there smiling. And she's the trustee of Project Pink Blue to list a few of her achievements. Prof, good afternoon. And thank you for join, joining us. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hope you are good and happy new year to thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you. You're looking really too. Yes, it's my pleasure. <laughs> You're looking very too. You're enjoying the sunshine and I'm freezing. All right, let, let's go ahead so that we can, <laughs> we can get quite a few in. Um, well, um, cervical cancer, it's, um, it's very interesting. Uh, it's a very interesting conversation. And I'd like you to educate us today on, on, what we need to know about it, to be honest with you. So let's start with it. What is cervical cancer and what is the burden of cervical cancer in Nigeria? Okay. Um, in Nigeria, uh, you have like 12,000 um, 12, deaths from uh, cervical cancer. Uh, actually, 12,000 new cases a year and um, 8,000 die from cervical cancer uh, yearly. So almost this translates to the fact that almost every hour, a woman dies from cervical cancer. It's a good way to put it. However, for many years now, the statistics has remained at 26 women die every day from cervical cancer. 26 women, and that uh, translates to um, a woman dying almost every hour in Nigeria. So that's the sad statistics for, especially for a disease entity that is completely preventable if we do the right things. Okay. So if we are if we are bearing in mind the burden on looking at it from the perspective of the number statistically, what what is cervical cancer? Okay, cervical cancer is like every other cancer, a, a, um, some changes in the cell, um, the nature of the cell that enables it to begin to function abnormally. Those crop of cells that have their origins in any particular organ, like in cervical cancer, it is at the neck of the womb. The cervix is the neck of the womb. The womb is the uterus where the harbor was the baby um, for nine months. But the neck of the womb is this structure that is referred to as the cervix, and as the name in, in, indicates, it is actually the neck of the womb. The child has to pass through the uterus, through the effaced cervix. The, the cervix effaces 
in order to permit it, uh, itself to be flush with the uterus and the baby comes out doing birth. So that is the location of the cervix. So any cancer that originates at that point of the neck of the womb of, of, the, of, um, of, the, of the uterus is referred to as cervical cancer. So like any other cancer, it's just a malfunction of cells that have become autonomous, uh, not uh, behaving or obeying any rules of um, serving their function and dying and being removed for new cells to regenerate. No, cancer cells will continue to multiply. Okay, so Prof, based on what you are explaining to us about the cervix and the importance of, um, or at least giving us clarity of where the location of this cancer is, is in the body, could you briefly explain to us the, or tell us the symptoms of cervical cancer? Because if we know what it is, what the symptoms are, we have a better chance of going forward and getting assessed. But in terms of symptoms, I would always like to start for cancer. I would always like to start with emphasizing that we don't like to have patients come when they have symptoms. We like people to come before they have symptoms so that we screen them and find it early when it can be managed. And when the um, you know the mortality and morbidity that are accrues from the disease will be at its most minimum. Now, but if you do have symptoms, the symptoms will go like this: from early symptoms to late symptoms. The early one will be where you are having some kind of discharge. You're having some kind of discharge, and that discharge may not be. Um, may not be a bloody discharge, just discharge. And that will be because there is an infection, uh, the HPV uh, infection, uh, which is resulting in some uh, more effluent uh, flow of the normal uh, um, you know, fluid that comes from your vagina. A lot of men know that, you know, they tend to and sometimes post, uh, 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 post your period, uh, three, four, five days after your period, uh, you still tend to have to wear something to ensure you're not flowing too much. So if you uh, have a continuous uh, discharge from your vagina, it's something that you need to go and have a look at and have somebody look inside through your uh, vagina to look at the cervix and see the state of the cervix. Is it undergoing some erosions, some changes? Uh, some people refer to it as dysplasia. And what kind of dysplasia is it? They can take some cells through pap smear, or they can do visual inspection with acetic acid to verify. But if you didn't go, and it proceeds into what we call dyspareunia, and that is when you start having pain after intercourse, you start having pain after intercourse. It's called dyspareunia. Um, you should really, any woman that has pain after intercourse should come and present herself to be further investigated. Another thing is if you've already stopped having your period and suddenly, uh, that is you've achieved menopause and suddenly you start having your period, then that is a, something to worry about. That is another symptom that you can have, which is, uh, your period, as if your period has restarted, bleeding after um, after menopause. Okay, then the next one is you actually bleeding, whether you are having your period or not having your pe period. That's serious. Uh, that those are now the late stages, and ap after a while, you will find that the woman has a distasteful uh, smell that accompanies her. And people are wriggling their noses when you are around because um, there is some, you know, um, manner of, you know, a, like a wound, a festering wound. But because it is inside, you don't know. The only thing is that you're feeling pain, but you are not wanting to come up. Most women don't like to go and reveal that anything is happening in their private uh, anatomy. So you find that a lot of women will come late because they're hiding. 
that are hiding uh, these symptoms. Yeah. So these are the symptoms that you, and then of course, in the very late stages, you can have some fistulations where you have, the, the uh, cancer has eroded through the vaginal wall, connected to the anal, to the anus, or it has ascended and it's in the, the, the bladder is anterior. So it can also have a vesico, uh, uh, vaginal fistula or vesico rectal uh, uh, sorry, um, yes, the psychorectal uh, fistula, yeah. And that's the idea. We're saying to you out there, if you need to have a check, you've got the idea of what the symptoms are. So let's look at, because the last thing we're going to focus on is going to be the awareness. What are the things to prevent us before we even get to this point is a key conversation for us today. So I'm going to ask you one question, and it goes, how long does it take for a woman to have to have the treatment plan for cervical cancer following all doing the th doing doing the three treatment in the correct program does that make sense um, okay so um what will, what usually determines the length of treatment is um how long um what is the stage the stage of um, uh, this cancer. So if you come at the late stages, of course, it's going to be a lot of uh, complications coming with it, a lot of interventions. Um, and that if you come early, especially if you were detected during screening, a screening is when you do not have any symptoms, but because you are of the right age, you have made yourself available at the right uh, hospital service or screening center to be screened for early detection. So if you're early detected, then you, can, you could have been detected at the stage where it is not cancer yet. That's the pre-malignant. It's not cancer yet. And all that needs to be done is to virtually like ablate those areas of dysplasia, those areas where the HPV, that is the human papillomavirus, has caused changes, uh, either by cryotherapy or by other methods uh, which the gynecologists have an ability to use to clear up those changes. Now, those changes by the human papillomavirus is very interesting to know that you have to have sustained infection with human papillomavirus and untreated for close to 10 to 20 years before you have, you know, um, the changes that will convert to cancer, to become cervical cancer. Now, when it becomes cervical cancer, you can have what they call a, a micro uh, you know, the one that you can only detect through looking at the cells in the mic microscope. So that is um, the stage where you, there are still very, very uh, interesting and curative procedures uh, that can be done uh, for that patient um, in that auction. And that patient can achieve, can, you know, you can achieve cure quite easily. You can achieve cure for such a patient. But then if you come in the post uh, microscopy um, uh, um, stage where you now, just by viewing, you are already seeing all the changes. And those changes, when you take uh, your pap smear, it it's reveals that definitely this patient has cervical cancer then you need to have other options like surgical treatment. Um, you can, um, other treatments like uh, chemotherapy, using drugs, other treatments like radiotherapy, immunotherapy, and um, all other uh, um, types of uh, therapies that are utilized these days. Uh, the, the more high ending, the higher the cost for uh, such a patient. Thank you, Prof. Um well, that's, that's, 
very detailed. Okay, so at what age should we start doing the cervical cancer screening? And how often? Okay, for, for screening, um, you know, earlier on, um, there was this idea that it's mostly postmenopausal women that will come up with it. But when, of course, uh, the association with the HPV uh, virus, the, uh, the human papilloma virus was seen, and it's now gated into the age of first sexual uh, you know, activity. So the earlier the sexual activity, the earlier the exposure to the virus. And then, of course, if you now put in like 15 to 20 years, you will almost be arriving because some studies have shown that it's as early as nine years. Some have shown it's as early as 14 years, 16 years. So if you add up, you'll be getting yourself into, um, from after 20, um, one should, you know, uh, uh, could have cervical cancer, really. Uh, because the earlier the sexual uh, exposure. And of course, you know, in some cultures, uh, there are females that, you know, uh, wed, uh, get married earlier. Uh, and that is uh, early, early marriages. So in such cultures, like in Nigeria now, breast cancer is supposed to be the number one female cancer in terms of prevalence. But some authorities will tell you that in the northern a region where early marriages are prevalent, you find that there is a switch of cervical cancer being uh, topping the list for uh, cancers in women. In the entire of the African region, cervical cancer could be said also to top the list and second being breast cancer. So it just depends on you know some of the data that is available uh, which you can get against what the cultures are doing. So even in Britain, um, one of the uh, British uh, celebrity uh, celebrities, uh, she got her cervical cancer at the age of 24. And at that stage, nobody offers you cervical cancer screening in Britain at that time. It was with her case and the advocacy she led after her uh, her. her her diagnosis that led to their reducing the age to 25. So from the age of 20 now, especially in the African setting with early marriages, one will say that it will be best for us to start screening from the age of 20. And you can do the, the kinds of screening you can do is either visual inspection with acetic acid, which is more affordable and more accessible are more available. The reason being that you do not need to have a, a pathologist's intervention in the process of completing the cycle of the screening. Uh, whereas if you do the one that is called perpendicular smear, the PAP smear, P-A-P-S, most people call it, the PAP smear, you will need to have a pathologist that will, you know, that will interpret uh, the, the the outcome of the specimen that you have obtained. So for the other one, which is visual inspection with acetic acid or visual inspection with lupal cyotin, you see, you make the diagnosis right there that there are, there are changes. You're not making a diagnosis that there is cervical cancer. That is only a pathological diagnosis. So you're making a diagnosis that there are changes that are you know, attributable to the human papilloma virus, and you can treat at the same time. So we call it see and treat, and you can treat with what is called a thermal ablation facility that is called the cryo uh, a cryotherapy. You know, and then that is um, able to uh, put a stop uh, to the progression of the changes that have, you know, have started. And once you are able to put a stop to the progression of those changes, you can actually stop the process of its progressing to uh, cancer. Now, not all human papilloma virus are oncogenic, have oncogenic ability. That is the, 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 that 
are able to translate uh, data to cancer. There are certain species that will result only in wats. That those are called low low risk, but the high risk one are um, about fourteen. But out of them, eighteen, uh, sixteen, and eighteen, I think sixteen and eighteen are the most uh, the most of the high the most prevalent of the oncogenic uh, type of the virus. And you have a vaccine that you can use to um, actually prevent the, uh, the, uh, the acquisition of the human papilloma virus. So you have a vaccine that will be able to uh, prevent it. And this vaccine is the mainstay uh, gold standard that is being advocated worldwide, which is why the world is moving towards cervical cancer elimination and the ongoing cervical cancer elimination campaign that started two years ago and has been heightened. Um, interestingly, Nigeria has adopted uh, to put in the human papilloma uh, 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 virus uh, vaccine in the national immunization program. And this is built to start in the third quarter, to start in the third quarter of this year, 2023, and it will be available free to the ages of uh, 9 to uh, 16 years. Thank you, Prof. You know, you've answered uh, the four questions I really had for you all in one. So based on what you're saying now, can I assume and can we say this is correct, that Nigeria can afford to ensure that children between the age of 9 and 16 years old will affect from the third quarter of the year we will be able to start to push for schools and all to um, um, encourage their children to go and take this vaccine. Are you saying that that is the status at which we are? Because one of the key things is there's no point us doing this awareness program if we're not um, monitoring that what is being said is actually happening. So are you saying that that it's, it's is the good? Point? It's good to it's good to publicize it um, because it will help us to hold the government accountable, won't it? What was said is that in the third quarter of this year, 2023, uh, it will, you know, it will start being rolled out. But it has definitely the, the policy is in place that it is going to be part of the national immunization uh, program, which is very, very, uh, I think, it's, it's applaudable. The best, best news. You know, in India, they are actually producing the vaccine themselves. So this is where we should be heading to. Because we have a huge population, and it would be best if we could ourselves get into production of the vaccine. Hmm. But, oh, that's a, that's that's a very good way for us to end this, actually, in my view, because at least you've you've been able to share the fact that there is hope for all of us. So, based on what you are saying to us now, is that this cervical cancer is um, is usually caused by this HPV. Now, that is the human papilloma virus infection is that that's correct right and it's a common virus um that you get from having unprotected sex i think i think we need to let people get clarity of what exactly it is. no um sorry can i correct that whether you protect sex or you don't protect sex i'm sorry <laughs> even if you are protecting it with trousers, <laughs> the human papilloma virus will be transferred once there is sexual contact, so but that's unprotected no, sex now. Not a it's not protect. Unprotected sex means that uh, protected sex means that you're wearing a condom. Yes, and even if your condom is a trouser. <laughs> oh my goodness! We learn. We learn every day. Course, you know, there's the oropharyngeal, and then unfortunately, also in uh, people with uh, HIV. Uh, you have a you know more florid uh, infection, and um, their immunity, of course, is down. So anything that can bring down your immunity, people with chronic diseases or, in, or on any form of immunotherapy uh, uh, that need immunotherapy or something like uh, people with uh, transplants, post-transplant uh, patients. Um, once your immunity is down, you'll have more propensity 
to uh, have the uh, HPV. But that doesn't mean that an able-bodied person will not have it. Mm. All right. So a point of correction to the viewers and to all of us that have had this myth, because now you see I have now learned a new myth. And that's one of the reasons I love this program, because I get all these consultants and all these doctors and all these specialists to come and tell us the myths from the facts. So thank you for that. You've clarified a new myth for us. And, and, but, we, but you will agree with us that there are no symptoms until the cancer starts to spread. So you don't really get symptoms except your normal discharge and um, you can have it and not even realize that you have cervical cancer because you just have only discharge, right? And you may not have any discharge. Aha, you and see another myth that is being clarified? Going. Yes, because um, if you ask people, okay, if you have discharge, come, no. Don't have anything. Just by the virtue of your age, go yes, and get a check. Thank you very so much. So when you do a check, you are more likely to find it at the you know stage where there are just minor changes that you can be it. taken care of right there in that one single visit that you have made. Fantastic. And Thank you, Prof. Yes. It is very important to note that cervical cancer, we have to get the, the, the doctors to do the work. So let us not just assume that um, we can just decide that we are the doctors on the job because we're not the doctors on the job. We need to go and get the help. And lastly, I want to point out that, as they've said, and we need to clap for ourselves and clap for Nigeria and the fact that they signed it in, that we will at least have access to the vaccine up until the age of 16 from nine-year-olds, starting third quarter of, of this year. The vaccine is affordable. Okay, so about please. how much is it then? Okay, um, I think now for two doses should be around maybe fifty thousand, and this is uh, the one, the one you know, uh, one effort. Nobody can do it for you if you can afford it. Make sure you go and get your tests. Go and do your checks regularly. Go and yes. if you are, if you are, if you are, if you have children, get them to do it. And please understand, I have had my own children. And they've all done it and all, they are all totally vaccinated to the last. I want to say to Prof and to the viewers, thank you all for joining us, uh, especially on this conversation of cervical cancer. We appreciate the management of PLOS TV Africa for sponsoring this um, awareness program. And to all our followers, we want to say thank you for sharing the cancer awareness episodes, clips, facts, and support us. Thank you all because together we, will, together we fight, together we win. Follow us on our social media pages at Common Cancer Foundation um, org. You can find us there. Share, subscribe, and click on the notification buttons. You will always find us Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn, everything we're there. Just try and ask the questions. Don't sit down and pretend you don't know. Thank you all for joining us today. It's been very nice chatting with you. And above all, thank you, Professor Ifoma, for actually being with us. You really did a good job with us. Thank you. And have a lovely week. God bless you all.